Hello and good evening everyone. My name is Catherine Turner and I'm the Exec Manager for Commissioning at the Hunter New England Central Coast Primary Health Network. And I'd like to welcome you all to uh, another event in our education series uh, promoting, promoting, um, sorry, assisting our primary care clinicians across the region with their management of many of the issues related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Tonight's, intro tonight's topic is thrombos thrombosis and thrombocytopenia with COVID-19 vaccine, a pragmatic approach. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on Aboriginal land wherever we are across the beautiful region and potentially around the country tonight, because I'm sure there are people joining us from outside of our region as well. I'm here on the land of the Awabakal and Waramai people, and I'd like to acknowledge the wisdom of elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge that we would normally be celebrating NADOC week this, this week and spending time with the community celebrating their various achievements and we're not able to do that and we do acknowledge the disappointment that brings but also uh, look forward to being able to hopefully catch up with some of those events in September. This session is being recorded and will be available from tomorrow on our PHN website which is thephn.com.au. You can access the presentation, the slides and previous recordings by clicking through on the education tab. We'll be using Slido for questions, uh, interactive polls and the session evaluation tonight. And we would really um, invite you to log into that so that you can participate in the event. You can access the polls and the question and answer tabs on the right side of your screen. Or alternatively, you can head to slido.com and enter the event code, which is hashtag CVT. A third option is by scanning the QR code on your mobile device, which will pop it up on your screen. So again, that hashtag is CVT. Please type your questions in throughout the session and we've allocated plenty of time for Q&A um, with the panel after the main presentations. Tonight, we're really pleased to welcome some of our colleagues um, to present on this very important topic. So our main presentation will be delivered by Associate Professor Anup Njeti, uh, Anup Njeti, sorry Anup, um, who is a staff specialist hematologist here in, in the Hunter region. We're joined by Dr. Tony Merritt from the Hunter New England Public Health Unit, who's a physician there taking a recurring role here on our PHN presentations. And Dr. Lee Fong, who's a local GP, who wears many other hats and is, is will be facilitating the questions and answers for us tonight. So thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Anoop and he will walk us through the challenges of thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. Thanks Anoop. Thank you, Catherine, and uh, good evening, everybody. Just start my presentation. So it's been a very challenging three months from the beginning of April when we were faced with some of the complications of the COVID-19 vaccine. And I had a couple of um, close associations with this problem, given my role within the Thrombosis and Hemostasis Society, as well as the advisory group, which has closely worked with ATAGI to develop some management guidelines nationwide. So I'll share with you some of my um, experiences through this journey and hopefully take you through a, a variety of scenarios that 
Um, a lot of questions have arisen in, in the last few months. So the objectives for this meeting really are to get a perspective of what the serious complications are, uh, is to understand how to approach the diagnosis, if there are strategies for early recognition, a uh, sort of sketch of management, because that, that often happens within the hospital rather than in primary care, and also some very valid questions on how to approach previous thrombosis, thrombocytopenia and vaccination. And hopefully we can have a very productive Q&A session at the end. So the perspective in the Australian context um, is this is from a TGA as of last week, uh, is that we have more than 7 million doses of vaccine administered. And there are a number of reports that the TGA and the AFI get to look at the complications and, and sift through the complications and the adverse events that are reported. And in terms of thrombosis and thrombocytopenia, this is the latest data that that's, we've got um, from last week. So, so we have about 70 cases from about seven and a half million vaccinations. And I'll go through this in a bit more detailed uh, fashion later on. And this is the breakdown of the outcome of these patients and a, a fair few of them need a treatment in the ICU but majority of them were discharged um, with a favorable, favorable outcome. Uh, there have been a couple of fatalities, as you will see. So this is the diagnostic criteria for this syndrome, is that you have a clot, usually in an unusual location with a low platelet count, and with or without antibodies that activate platelets fall into one diagnostic category, and then if you have patients where you find clots in more common locations, such as the legs or the lungs, and a low platelet count, you have to have uh, a test that detects antibodies that confirms the diagnosis. So there are some situations where this case definition is not met. And that sort of is adjudicated on the basis of a number of other things. You will have heard of a lot of acronyms used. Some of the acronyms used include VIPIT, WIT. Um, in the professional society that I'm involved in, VIT is very commonly used. It's also the term that's been used in a number of publications, including the NEJM, which first reported this syndrome. Um, whereas TTS is the term which is much broader um, and used by TGA, FDA, and other regulatory authorities. Um, and sort of removes some specific reference to any vaccine association with that term. Okay, so Paul 1, could we have the Paul 1 on, please, Charles? So I do have a number of polls. Uh, we have a total of 10 polls during this um, session, so I'm going to be checking as well what happens. Um, And excellent to be want to stop the poll, please. Very good. I, I, I can see that. Majority of the people have been listening to the previous slide, which is great. So the tier one definition, as we will see in the next slide, um, is that you don't have to have an antibody test. You just need to have um, a thrombosis at an unusual site and thrombocytopenia to fulfill the case definition. Whereas in tier two, when you actually have thrombosis in a usual site, then you do need to have the blood test result being positive, which is a heparin PF4 ELISA hit antibody. And I'll, I'll come to that in a short while. 
Okay, let's move on straight into a patient. Um, this is somebody I looked after. So 52 year old female, for various reasons, I've changed some of the demographic detail, who presented to the ED with headache, nausea, vomiting, no swelling of the limbs. She's 12 days post vaccine, otherwise very active. She had an DVT below knee in her 20s, thought to be related to an oral contraceptive pill she was on. She has had a diagnosis of SLE in the past, but not on any active treatment and no active symptoms at the moment. So interestingly, five days prior, she presented to the ED, and this was day seven post uh, AZ vaccine. Her platelets were normal. And at that time, the coags were done and the D-dimer was elevated and the fibrinogen was elevated. She had pain in her lower limb and she had an ultrasound, which was actually normal. And she was discharged home as the pain resolved. But symptoms, new symptoms arose on day 11. These symptoms worsened and she presented on day 12 to ED again, uh, first to a private setting and then subsequently to John Hunter. There was no focal neurology at that time and there were no symptoms to suggest any other sites of pathology. And lo and behold, her platelets now are 24. She's got very low fibrinogen of 0.6 and the D-dimer is undetectable on our system. So very, very high. So we did a few other things like, you know, lupus anticoagulant testing, which was all negative. And she had a CT venogram to look at why she was having the headache, malaise and vomiting. She had a CT brain to start with. There were some abnormalities there and the CT venogram, as you'll see, shows reduced perfusion uh, in the transverse sinus indicating a thrombosis there. So we initiated some treatment immediately. We gave her some cryoprecipitates due to low fibrinogen. She got intravenous immunoglobulin she was commenced on an anticoagulant called agatroban because that's an intravenous infusion, which is non-heparin based and can be easily modulated. Uh, and the anticoagulation is quite, uh, can be quite easily turned off should she need a surgical intervention. And that can be easily monitored using an APTT. Um, two days into the admissions, second day of admission, she developed new expressive dysphagia and ataxia. So this was her starting CT scan. And in 24 hours, she had developed a left temporal bleed. Um, and this often happens in the setting of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. She then underwent a clot retrieval procedure. Um, because one of the reasons why people have hemorrhage is because of increased venous sinus pressure, as the venous sinuses are not draining adequately. And this was some of the specialized testing that was sent off, which all gave evidence to the fact that she had some antibodies which were triggering off this sort of immune thrombocytopenia and thrombosis process. So further treatment after day two was interventional uh, neurologist to retrieve the clot, like I mentioned. And she was then readmitted to ICU for ongoing agatroban infusion and titration. So platelets recovered to 164 within four days. The new neurology stabilized. And over the next few days, she began to improve by leaps and bounds. So then we stopped the agatroban and switched to an oral anticoagulant dabigatran. She was then discharged to stroke rehab from where she's been subsequently been discharged home and doing really well. So just some principles of management of suspected TTS or WIT, whatever you'd like to call it, is we do test for presence of antibodies, and this is available in selected reference labs only. And this helps us with confirming particularly the tier two cases. We often use non-heparin anticoagulants, 
um, based on our understanding of a related medical problem called HITS, and I'll come to that shortly. And these include agatroban, bivalurudin, denaparoid or fondaparanox, uh, which we don't often use in the community or the outpatient setting, but are often used in the setting of a liver transplant surgery, a cardiac surgery in a patient with HITS, for example. We generally avoid platelet transfusions in spite of the fact that the platelets are very low because they're often activated and promote thrombosis. And we try and suppress the immune system by using intravenous immunoglobulin. In some situations, we've used high-dose steroids as well. Okay. So I would like you all to vote on what the first tier lab tests should be in a suspected VIT patient. And I'm going to start. Okay, excellent. Lots of people um, getting it right. Fantastic. So the first tier tests um, for this particular diagnostic challenge is to just do platelet count, a D-dimer and fibrinogen. So obviously coags, but make sure you've ordered D-dimer and fibrinogen because when you just order coags alone, these tests don't get done, as a matter of fact. Um, and this is the sort of national guideline that we've developed from the TANS Professional Society, which is the Thrombosis and Hemostasis Society of Australia and New Zealand. Um, and that's the first tier of investigations we recommend as well. And this is consistent with several other international guidance that is available. So essentially, this also fits in with all the published cases. So most of the cases have had platelet counts less than 150, a very high D-dimer, usually more than five times the upper limit of normal, and most cases at low fibrinogen. Uh, apart from specialized guidance for hematologists dealing with this problem across the country, we've also got a multidisciplinary VIT guideline for doctors uh, for use mainly by uh, people in emergency department or in general practice manned um, hospitals or in circumstances where a patient comes up to a GP practice and needs urgent testing. Most of these patients, mind you, are sick and are likely to present to hospital. Um, but there is guidance, and this is an excerpt from that guidance for, uh, for all doctors. Um, so if you've had a vaccine in the last 42 days, uh, you obtain urgent blood tests. And if those blood tests are abnormal, then you go down a certain pathway. If the blood tests are normal, then you go down the VIT unlikely pathway with some caveats that in certain circumstances, if you have a really high D-dimer, normal platelet and thrombosis, there may be reason to sort of repeat a platelet count to ensure that the platelets are not dropping. So the tempo of disease can vary, so it's important to capture that time point. And this is the guidance that's been put out by ASEM, which is the Australian College of Emergency Physicians, um, which is along very similar lines and um, really has a sort of a two by two table, which tells you which way to go. And if you have TTS likely or TTS unlikely and the gray zone in between where it's possible, or it could be alternative diagnosis there to consider. And if you've suspected TTS, then you obviously get hematology assistance, which leads on to the other guidance. And this is a sort of an online form that we have available where you need to send testing. So I generally don't recommend people to do this testing unless uh, 
you've actually discussed it with a hematologist and they feel that it's required, particularly in the outpatient setting, um, I think this is unlikely to be required. And we correlate it with this sort of timing of the dose, the platelet counts and what, what else they might be on in terms of medication where this might be uh, contributing. So this is our local Australian data for all patients presenting with suspected VITS and confirmed as per the THANS criteria and some of them are still awaiting adjudication by TGA. We did find a couple of patients, including the case that I mentioned where the platelets were above 150. So it's important to sort of take the clinical context, but more than 95% of the patients are likely to have low platelets at presentation. Almost everybody had D-dimer raised. However, raised D-dimer can occur in a variety of situations. So just a raised D-dimer doesn't indicate much. It has to be a constellation of lab findings plus thrombosis plus, you know, uh, the timing uh, being four to 42 days. And an unusual site of thrombosis is usually more likely than a usual site. So it's a combination of different things. Um, as you can see, the age there for confirmed it is 60 years. But we did in Australia introduce very early uh, the age limit for Pfizer vaccine. And that's the reason why that's showing up as a median of 60. And days post vaccine, you can see it ranges from three to four days right up to 40 days, which is why the recommendation of 42 days. So when you have a situation like a tier two, where you have a thrombosis in a usual site, there's a thrombocytopenia, raised D-dimer, and you're not sure, then that's where the consultative process starts. Obviously, they're already on an anticoagulant, and then you might have to do some specialized testing, which the hematologist may, will be very happy to help with. And that includes testing for what is called as anti-PF4 antibodies. And why this? Um, because there's only certain tests which can pick these anti-PF4 antibodies. Um, and they have previously been described in a condition called HIT or heparin-induced thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. But those tests do not, in general, detect these antibodies. So we really need some specialized testing on what is called an ELISA platform to be able to detect them. So just a little bit more. And before that, I think I have a couple of polls. So let's go with poll three. All right, so interesting poll results. Okay, we might stop there because we need to talk a little bit about hits. And the answer for the previous question was if you have a previous hits, you don't get the AZ vaccine. Now, HITS is a condition called heparin-induced thrombosis and thrombocytopenia syndrome. And basically, it is related to the fact that it, heparin, uh, which is often given in the setting of, in, you know, uh, cardiac surgery or surgical procedures where you need an intravenous drug treatment for anticoagulation, and it can combine with a platelet protein called platelet factor four. And together, that provides a new antigen for antibodies to be produced. And these antibodies then react with other platelets within the body and activate them. So this is often only seen in the hospital setting and we diagnosed it based on some clinical scoring criteria 
which includes the degree of thrombocytopenia, the timing of the platelet fall, thrombosis, and whether there are any other co conditions that can cause the thrombocytopenia, like listed here. And then when we have suspected HIT, we have a clinical score followed up with a lab test, which confirms the presence or absence of HIT. There's a confirmatory test called serotonin release, which works on the principle of a functional release of serotonin from platelets to be able to make the diagnosis. Now, why is that important? That is important in this setting because this condition of thrombotic thrombocytopenia after the COVID-19 vaccine, the adenoviral vector vaccine, which had OX1, uh, has very similar clinical presentation in the sense that it has both thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. And the first papers which came out also showed that most patients had antibodies to platelet factor four. So it resembled HIT very, very closely. Although none of these patients ever received heparin. So it seems to be an independent mechanism, whereas there's an antibody to platelet factor four and another immune antigen. We don't know what that is. And that's very similar to what happens in heat. It's not heparin, but what else it could be, we don't know as yet. And that seems to activate normal platelets elsewhere in the body. And those activated platelets cause thrombosis. And that's what we exploit in actually the diagnostic testing as well. So there's a whole heap of functional testing we can do um, including flow cytometry, uh, multi-plate electrode-based testing, serotonin release, which we've all adapted to diagnosing this, this particular condition with more accuracy. Okay, next question. I think most people have got it right. So, um, so the current recommendation is if you have a past history of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and or thrombosis, you get Pfizer as the recommended vaccine. And I think you will now appreciate the reasons why, because it's a closely overlap syndrome with HIT, um, the VIT. Um, we don't know as yet what causes the antibody production but because of its close relationship and the way the condition behaves, uh, we have assumed that similar mechanisms exist and giving um, a, a vaccine that may trigger similar antibodies may be good reason to avoid the AZ vaccine in this situation. And a similar sort of principle applies for a patient with previous cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. That's a very rare thrombotic condition. We really don't understand what causes it. It often occurs in young females. And that is another reason why we've recommended Pfizer in that uh, particular condition as well. And so there is a list of other conditions where we've described Pfizer to be the recommended vaccine. All right, so from now on, I have case snippets which probably address a lot of questions which I have received or some of my colleagues have received in the community. So we'll go through some of those scenarios and there's some explanatory sort of slides accompanying them. So if you all want to start the, this particular poll, that would be great.
<clears throat> All right, we move on to the um, explanation, which is the risk of TTS is not likely to be increased. Um, if you've had previous history of clots in typical sites, so usual DVT or PE, increased clotting risk, including a family history of clots that's not immune mediated because the mechanism is typically thought to be immune mediated in TTS. Um, and therefore, um, we've recommended that, you know, COVID vaccine can, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine can still be uh, used in in the in the age group beyond 60 um, even if you have those conditions because we don't have evidence to say that these conditions will actually recur or there's an increased risk if you have the AZ vaccine so to put some risks into perspective um, a current risk for TTS and I'll come to this a bit later is about four to six in a million uh, the chance that somebody in the community has DVT or PE is about two per thousand per year. Uh, cerebral venous thrombosis is two to three per hundred thousand. Uh, if you were a young person, a young woman on oral contraceptive, uh, then it's five per 10,000. Uh, a DVT can be associated with pregnancy and that's a very, very high risk, one to two per thousand and air travel is one per 5,000 flights. So to, compared with that, the risk of thrombosis and thrombocytopenia syndrome with COVID vaccines is very, very small. Okay, let's go on to the next one. 65 year old in her 30s who had a pregnancy loss due to suspected lupus anticoagulant when she was in her 30s and no other history of thrombosis. What would you pick? This is a tough one. I'll wait for a little bit longer. Because there are certain nuances as to what we would consider in this patient. And um, it is very closely linked to the next question. So I think we've got enough responses for the previous one. So could we move on to this poll, please? And then I'll discuss both together. Thank you, Charles. So this is a more complex patient that a lot of us might likely face in general practice. So somebody with multi-organ problems, 71-year-old with cirrhosis due to NASH, has a history of prostate cancer, had radiotherapy for that two years ago. So this, this is an actual patient that I, I consulted on, on hormone therapy, um, past history of cirrhosis, and had an associated portal vein thrombosis at that time. Um, and the question is, what vaccine should we offer? Okay, I think we've got a fair few answers already. So, okay, so the important thing here is to read um, that it should be a past history of idiopathic splanchnic vein thrombosis. So idiopathic is the key. So speaking to my gastroenterology colleagues, both locally and nationally, who've had input into the TANS guidelines and the ATAGI statement. Uh, portal wine thrombosis is very common in the setting of cirrhosis, so it would not be considered idiopathic. And the fact that the patient has prostate cancer and on hormone therapy, we don't know what that has uh, an impact on, but we, we do know that, it, you know, the portal wine thrombosis is sort of not idiopathic in this person. So we would still recommend an AZ vaccine for that patient. 
And the second lady, with the first lady, in fact, with antiphospholipid syndrome, it's only for those with established thrombosis. So documented antiphospholipid syndrome who meet all the criteria and clearly documented venous or arterial clots. So in most instances, pregnancy loss is a clinical criteria, but not necessarily a venous or an arterial clot for this syndrome. So again, that lady would only be eligible for the AZ vaccine as per the current criteria. Okay, the next poll. So this is actually one of my patients. Um, a 75 year old who has CLL and moderate thrombocytopenia, platelets around 90. He has ischemic heart disease and is on aspirin. So what do you wish to do? Okay, so I've got a fair few responses there and they're all looking pretty much on the ball, which is great. So again, previous history of ischemic heart disease or stroke, current or past thrombocytopenia, those receiving anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy can all be given AZ vaccine. The important thing in this scenario is to monitor the platelet counts and very interestingly, in this particular patient, um, the platelet counts remain fairly stable, did not change at all. Um, having said that, there is a, a, probably a small risk of thrombocytopenia with any vaccine. First described with measles vaccine way, way um, a long time ago, about 30, 30 odd years ago. Um, and the natural history of ITP is very variable. So there are probably a lot of patients in the community who've never had a blood test before, who run slightly low platelets or lowish platelets. And we don't know what the reasons are. Um, and it is felt that with this um, vaccine, ITP may get worse. But the fact is that we looked at our recent registry data within Australia and um, as the vaccine was being rolled out and we noticed that people's platelet counts fluctuated unpredictably. And so whether some of the data that's being reported in the literature is just a reflection of that, or whether it's truly lowering off the platelet count and the setting of the vaccine is a bit unclear to me. Um, there's a fair bit of support documentation on uh, ITP patients that we can sort of, you can look into and specifically discuss. But in most patients, uh, platelets do not fall or do not fall to a level where it's worrisome. And therefore, closely monitoring the platelet count with the vaccine is, is all you need to do. And, and how frequently, you might ask. And I've been sort of doing it weekly for a few weeks um, after each dose of the vaccine. And if they've been stable, I've just been up getting them to... Uh, ring me back if they've got any problems. Okay, we are getting to poll number nine. So a lady who's had a DVT after the first AZ vaccine, but did not meet criteria for WIT. So platelets were normal, d dimer were only slightly raised, fibrinogen was normal. So what do we do? So I've got some interesting poll results. So I will go back to the recommendations again. So obviously there are some conditions where the Pfizer vaccine is preferred. 
And this last statement here, so other serious adverse events attributed to the first dose of COVID-19 vaccine, AstraZeneca. Now, although it is hard to link up uh, a pulmonary embolus or a DVT to the vaccine itself in the absence of VIT, because it's occurred in that time frame, it falls into that gray zone. It's often very hard to convince this patient to have a second dose of the AZ vaccine. And given the current safety and immunogenicity data, and the fact that there could be variable uh, sort of serious adverse events related to the vaccine, this particular statement was included to be en to enable patients who had uh, a DVT or a PE after their first dose of AstraZeneca to complete their vaccination and have Pfizer as a second dose. So you can request for Pfizer as a second dose if they have a DVT or PE after their first dose, even though it may not be um, proven to be related to the vaccine, but is temporally associated. So there's a time relationship. And so therefore it's attributed to the first dose. This is the last poll and I'll spend a couple of more minutes on this one. So this is the toughest one. So a patient who wants a discussion on the risks and benefits of the vaccine as he has a family history of clots. And this is just to find out how supported you all feel in having this sort of discussion more than any sort of um, question that, that, that is related to a clinical scenario. So I'd be very, very interested in what you all feel. So the poll shows that about 72%, as it stands now, about 70 odd percent feel they have the support and the stats to discuss this with this patient. And about 30 odd, um, it's changed to 60 and 40 now, but um, still sort of would need more guidance in how to support this person. So I'll take you through a few slides. So all this information is available on the web and I'll, I'll tell you where to find it. So the first scenario is when your infection rate is very similar to the first wave of COVID-19. So low risk situation. So as you can see, the red or the or red uh, column on the left is potential harms related to blood clots and on the blue, column is the potential benefits. So it tells you the number of deaths prevented, the ICU admissions prevented, and the hospitalizations prevented. And clearly you can see, even in the low risk situation, as your age increases beyond 60, the risk shifts from blood clots, potential harm from blood clots to potential benefits. So this is when there were only 29 infections for 100,000 people in a 16 week period. So over four months, there were very few infections, but you still prevented a lot of ICU admissions and deaths by vaccinating people. So if you actually weighed up in numbers, this is what it would look like. I'll move to the next slide, which is, um, so what happens if it's moderate risk? So something like what happened in Melbourne during the second wave of COVID, you can see that in the blue column, you prevent a huge number of infections and deaths and with very few clots. And in fact, the number of clots don't change very much. And that's because the clots are very rare. Whereas when you have an active infection, the number of ICU admissions and the number of deaths due to uh, COVID increase dramatically as the age increases. So again, this can be tabulated if your patient uh, likes actual numbers. And you can see that, you know, we did have more TTS in the younger age group, uh, particularly in the 40 to 50. And therefore now the age group for AstraZeneca um, is over 60 only, where we think the benefit uh, 
uh, hugely outweighs the risks. Um, and then if you have very high infection rates, like what happened in Europe, uh, and in fact in India, it was about twice as much as this recently, uh, you will notice that the benefits sort of clearly outweigh the risks, particularly in those over the age of 60, um, where the number of ICU admissions and the number of deaths go up dramatically as your age goes up. So I think this sort of statistics is useful in informed decision making jointly with a patient. And again, I go back to the fact that you know, there are some reports saying men and women, but we found, and given that our, our population was mainly over the age of 60 by the time, or at least over the age of 50, we did not find a difference between men and women in that scenario. So there's lots of resources, uh, and this presentation will be up on the web. So there's TGA resources, there's health.gov resources, um, there's the health safety notice, which gives you a detail of what to do. Um, there's the specialist immunization advice, which you can seek. There's a phone number you can ring or an email you can send, an after hours contact. If you have any adverse reaction or if you need any help with providing the second dose of the vaccine and making decisions on that, you don't know whether the adverse event was related to the vaccine or not, um, this group is able to help you. Um, and the last topic I just want to dwell on is can TTS be recognized early? And like I said, we are going to update our THANS document. So one of the things we do want to focus on is given the handful of patients who had a higher platelet count than 150, we do want that to be repeated, particularly if they're presented to emergency with thrombosis. Um, and that is being incorporated into the next level of guidance. And these are the signs and symptoms that sort of you look for, for cerebral venous sinus thrombosis or splanchnic vein thrombosis. Um, and if you have persisting symptoms, uh, even with a normal platelet count, suggest repeating the full blood count or consider additional imaging. Um, if the symptoms do not resolve. In fact, there's a patient um, uh, vaccine side effect tracker, which I found very interesting and perhaps maybe useful for some of your patients who are app savvy. And I actually did this as a mock uh, with sort of symptoms that might suggest splanchnic vein thrombosis and lo and behold, it tells you to call the emergency right now. So I think the symptom tracker does work. It may overcall things, but I think in this sort of scenario, overcalling is perhaps better than undercalling. So the aim uh, as, as a professional society from FANS has been to make it a more manageable complication rather than a vaccine limiting one whilst informing the local and national um, regulatory authorities on what is the best approach. And that's what we've tried to do. Uh, and as a local hematologist, we are also happy to provide advice um, in a structured way, often it's hard to take phone calls in on, on an ad hoc basis, but uh, we can provide quite easily in a structured way if there's any specific um, sort of questions that can be, you know, channeled into a telehealth clinic and so on and so forth. Um, happy to take questions and welcome my support team with Tony and Lee onto the panel so we can feel some of the questions. Thank you, I'll stop sharing now. Just acknowledging all the different people who actually were part of this, including the advisory group, which my colleague Vivian Chen leads, uh, the testing group, which Dr. Emmanuel Favalaro leads, and a lot of communication and collaboration we've had with Public Health, New South Wales Health, ATAGI and TGA, as well as some international collaborators um, in the UK and Canada. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Anouk. That was fantastic. Um, very interesting, informative, and educational. So, really appreciate that. I certainly learnt significant amounts of information from that and uh, a bit of recalibration going on in my own head there.
there's quite a few questions. Um, so we may go a little bit over time. Uh, if uh, the people online can hang on, we'll try and get to all the questions. The first question I'll bring up, uh, I think is was answered, I think, during the course of the talk. It's uh, the case of a 70-year-old lady with a history of lupus disorder under surveillance who had a PE three weeks after AstraZeneca. So the question is, can she have her second dose of AstraZeneca? From, from what you said, Anoop, it's sounding like this would fit under the serious adverse event. That's right, Lee. So um, obviously we don't have enough data to see if the background rate of VT is actually increased. What we do know that uh, TTS does occur, and this may not fit, this may not have fit the criteria for TTS, but the fact that this person had a PE in that temporal, in that temporal association, yes, definitely would go for a Pfizer for the second dose. Okay, so is what you're saying, Anoop, is that there is the formal diagnosis of TTS, and then yep. is there a little bit of a, there's a gray zone where we're making some allowance? There's a gray zone because what we don't know is if the background VT rate has changed at all. And having a PE or, or, a, or an extensive DVT is a serious adverse event. And although we haven't clearly established causality in that situation, it would still be recorded as an adverse event for the purposes of TGA. And therefore, that would fit criteria as we've got it down now for a Pfizer okay, so in fact, second it's... dose. Tony, do you want to Sorry, comment? Tony. Oh, look, I just wondered if I might um, uh, uh, jump in and, and just make a comment and invite further um, reaction from a oh, no, fantastic presentation thank you um, I, I guess my sense is there's a a, uh, a growing understanding about the kind of spectrum of illness we've now got a, a, a better handle on that core TTS nicely defined as per those documents but Anoop, I just invite you perhaps to to comment on what we think about the spectrum and and whether we're there's a kind of growing understanding about the kind of range of conditions that might eventually come under the, the broader umbrella of, of this type of reactions. Yeah, thanks, Tony. That's a great question. Um, uh, you're absolutely right as we now understand this disease. And, and, and just putting it into perspective, the first time we'd all heard about this was uh, early April. So we've tried to gain a lot of momentum in understanding what this means and how to pick it and what, what is the pathophysiology. And so we don't really know what actually drives this as yet. There are some uh, patients where they have had clots in unusual sites, they've had borderline platelets and the testing's not conclusive. So that needs to be considered as well, but they do seem to have severe thrombosis. So for that reason, I think there is a spectrum and there are there are some gray zone cases where we don't really know um, how best to classify them, apart from the fact that they have thrombocytopenia and thrombosis, um, but either have some, some other element missing, so they don't have a positive test or they don't, have the time frame right, or they may they may have only borderline platelets, or platelets may not have fallen. So that there are some uh, gray areas there, and you're absolutely right, Tony. And that that is one of the reasons we have that leave as well within the guidance to cover that um, sort of area where we don't understand exactly what might be happening in that given patient. Thanks for that, Anoop. Um, talking about gray zones, I might move on to the next question. So this one presents the case of um, a client who had a non-STEMI uh, ACS one week after AstraZeneca. Um, it says here the public health unit said there was no evidence of TTS and so they were okay to have the second dose. On the other hand, the ICU medical officer said to the client, was probably due to the AstraZeneca vaccine. So who was right and who was wrong? 
I wish I would. I could. I had a test to tell me. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't think we will ever know um, until more data comes out. Um, I think Tony will be familiar with the Scottish data that's just been published in Nature Medicine, which is they had ninety-nine um, percent of the day of the people in Scotland vaccinated, and they really had everything doc you know every piece of data collected from their public health system uh, and they did not find an increase in the um, cardiovascular events after um, the chadox one vaccine which is what, what we have here as the astrazeneca vaccine um, so that's epidemiological data is that applicable to that individual patient and can we be absolutely sure it had nothing to do. I don't know. But given that piece of epidemiological data and given the fact that myocardial infarctions are much more common than vaccine-induced thrombosis, thrombocytopenia, I would say yes. And I think um, it is unlikely to be linked. Um, and was it wit? I think that we can be sure of that it's not because I presume this patient had platelet count and uh, D-dimer and uh, uh, some sort of lab testing done. Not knowing all those results, I would presume they were all normal, which was the reason why uh, there was a decision or, or a communication that this was not WITS, which is, uh, I think, very reasonable. Now, whether to give the patient a second dose of AZ or not is a trickier thing because without knowing the causality uh, without knowing, you know, whether this could be linked or not, um, uh, it's a hard one. If uh, based on the Scottish data, though, I would say that there's no increased risk of cardiovascular events after the Chadox one vaccine, and therefore I think it's unlikely to be related to that. In which case, is what I'm hearing you say then, Anoop, is that you don't regard this as being a quote unquote serious adverse event or that it seems unlikely to be so and therefore doesn't it's slow fit the switching over. yeah it doesn't fit the criteria it's it's not been reported as an advert so so venous clots uh, myocardial infarction isolated coronary artery events have not been reported as a spectrum of vit or tts in any of the publications People who've had and, VIT and TTS in association have also had myocardial infarx. Okay, so that's really interesting. And I think this probably does raise that question about the advice that's coming from some of our colleagues. So in this particular case, uh, from an ICU medical officer, and uh, I've certainly come across uh, one other patient who the cardiologist uh, had strongly recommended to the, a patient with a history of ischemic heart disease that they should not have the AstraZeneca vaccine and had directed the GP to please arrange a Pfizer vaccination for the patient. How would you respond mm -hmm. to that sort of uh, advice? Uh, look, I think there's a lot of, um, obviously, people are worried about what might cause the TTS and if there's any sort of previous medical history or, or other medical problems that might make you more prone. So the only thing we know that makes you more prone or we, we think we know that is more likely to increase your risk is age. So the younger the age, the more likely you are to have TTS and more severe it is likely to be. So that is the only association we have so far. Um, we certainly haven't seen any increase in patients with previous ischemic heart disease, previous VTE or DVTs. Um, so there's nothing to suggest that people who have cardiac or vascular problems or have previous DVT or VTE are at increased risk for the syndrome. So based on what we discussed earlier, the pathophysiology of this is some sort of an immune trigger. Uh, 
And that doesn't seem to depend on pre-existing medical conditions. And why younger people have a more severe syndrome and why younger people have more severe thrombosis? We still don't know whether it's related to how their immune system responds or some other biological factor. We're, we're trying to understand that, but we don't have answers for that. But that is the only thing that we know of that predicts your risk. And if you're 60 years or younger, it's more likely to have, uh, you know, to occur. If you're 60, above 60 years, it's less likely to occur. That's, look, that's really interesting information, Anoop. So does that mean, for example, the having a, has, a past history of, say, HITS, having a past history of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, having a past history of antiphospholipid syndrome uh, with uh, thrombosis, has it actually been proven that any of those things increase the risk of TTS post-AstraZeneca? Um very interesting question, Lee, and thank you for asking this. Um, uh, in fact, no. So there is no evidence published as yet that tells us that patients with previous CVST or HITS um, have an increased risk of this recurring with the vaccine. The only common link, though, is uh, at least with HITS and antiphospholipid syndrome and thrombosis, it's that it's immune mediated. So the only link is mechanistic. So there's an assumption there. And uh, the assumption is that because it's immune mediated thrombosis, uh, there may be a chance that VIT being an immune mediated thrombosis may occur at a higher frequency, but there's no published data to support that. This is just expert opinion. Um, there is However, other things to consider, for example, in HIT, uh, you would, you would, um, so the problem there might be diagnostic. So if, if a patient with pre-existing HIT also developed WIT, it may be very difficult to tease out um, what might have happened and what anticoagulant may be best to use. And so for those reasons, we felt it was important to not confuse the issue further, and therefore that that group was recommended to have the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, regarding CVST, it's a very rare syndrome, like two or three per 100,000 a year. So we still don't understand the biology of it and whether it's, there's a component of immune-mediated thrombosis or not. But given the very unusual site of thrombosis, both CVST and splanchnic, and the fact that it occurs very rarely, um, the expert opinion was that it was safer to give these people Pfizer vaccine uh, in the event that they developed uh, TTS, it would be very hard to work out whether there was any relationship or whether they had any sort of predisposing factors to their, pre you know, to their previous CVSD or not. Um, so it was for those practical reasons that this guidance was developed. There's no published data as yet to say that these people are more prone. And in fact, anecdotal data suggests some people are with previous hits and some people with previous CVSD have been given AZ vaccine and nothing has happened. Um, I've not, uh, I've heard anecdotal reports of the fact that they did not develop TTS. So again, reassuring the community that um, in the event that somebody does get it by accident, it's not end of the world. And so in some ways you could say that uh, HIT, CVST, splanchnic vein thrombosis, not actually contraindications to AstraZeneca. That is the reasoning why the terminology is preferred, not uh, contraindicated. Uh, so mm. the terminology that the Atagi uh, Than statement guidance uses is preferred um, because this is based on expert opinion. Um, it is not based on a large body of it. In fact, it's not based on any published data so far. Fantastic. Um, we should return to some of these questions instead of having our little sidebar conversation here. Uh, the, the next question, it's uh, somewhat similar, I think, again, talking about 
what uh, what are contraindications, if you like, to AZ. So this one is about a 70-year-old lady with a brain aneurysm under surveillance by a neurologist, was told by the neurologist that it was a family member. If it was a family member, he would not have the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, the vaccine centre didn't accept my referral for Pfizer. Um, what would your comment be on that, Aloup? Um, it's an interesting um, suggestion by the neurologist. Again, I would go back to the fact that we don't have uh, any evidence that brain aneurysms predispose to CVST, which is one spectrum of WITS, or cerebral venous thrombosis. Um, and in fact, cerebral venous thrombosis is less and less common with age. Predominantly happens in younger women. So would be very unlikely to occur in a 70 year old. Um, so I personally would not be strongly recommending against the AZ vaccine. I would probably monitor her very closely and go with it, uh, discuss the risks and benefits and, and make a sort of joint decision with a patient. Uh, like I've discussed, um, Lee, we, we really don't know what, what causes this. And this is such a rare, a random event that, you know, we could think up of a hundred different clinical scenarios, which might somewhat uh, predispose to it. But but this, the closest we can find is people where there's an immune mechanism for thrombosis. Um, all the others very unlikely to be predisposing to thrombosis of this nature. Thanks for that, Anoop. Um, Tony, maybe one for you. Is, um, is splenectomy a contraindication to AstraZeneca? No, look, the, as Anoop was saying, the list of actual solid contraindications is very short. Um, and so it's um, a an anaphylactic um, serious allergic reaction to a vaccine or a component of the vaccine um, or um, <clears throat> thrombosis and thrombocytopenia after a first dose of, uh, of COVID vaccine AstraZeneca. Um, so the, the, the core strongly worded contraindications are, are very brief uh, and, and few in number. And then the rest, as Anoop says, um, uh, so succinctly uh, fall into the, the kind of group of recommendations, the, the categories. So um, I'm very happy for Anoop to leap in there, but, um, uh, but that's yeah, not, not a contraindication. Fantastic. Um, one of the questions that's up on the screen is how do we refer patients for Pfizer vaccine who have had uh, hit in the past? And I guess for any of the very brief list that's just been mentioned of patients for whom Pfizer is a recommended vaccine, how is that referral made? Um, I can probably answer this one and point people to Health Pathways. So if you go to the Health Pathways uh, vaccine infam oh hang on there's a specific page now which is uh, vaccination referrals and advice so if you go to that page it will tell you exactly how to do it there is a uh, a form that you can fill in uh, we can download and fill it in and then you email it to uh, the provided email address if you were to provide some supporting evidence uh, some supporting documentation, that would be fantastic and much appreciated. Um, and that will be reviewed uh, by a collection, a motley collection of general practitioners uh, sitting in uh, the John Hunter Vaccination Hub, uh, and we'll respond to that as soon as we can. So that's how you do that referral. Um, a really fascinating question now, uh, Anoop, doesn't Pfizer also cause TTS? Yeah. Um interesting so it does cause thrombocytopenia for sure so the first reports of thrombocytopenia following um the mrna vaccines were from the us um and certainly that that was recognized very early in the piece um but the constellation of thrombosis and thrombocytopenia uh, with the mrna vaccines uh, there's only been one case report in my uh in my reading that appeared last week in the Annals of Hematology in the US. Um, that's the first one where they demonstrated the presence of antibodies 
uh, anti-PF4 antibodies in a setting where there was thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. But so it seems it does probably occur. There's not been a second case report to my knowledge, um, but it's extremely rare. I mean, there's been millions of Pfizer doses uh, given out. So I suspect if this is the first case report, it's extremely rare. But thrombocytopenia per se occurs perhaps uh, just as commonly with Pfizer as with the AZ, if not a bit more. It was first described with the Pfizer vaccine. There was and there were a series of case reports early on, weren't there? I remember this being a, a story that got quite a, a bit of traction if we go back a good few months, which d didn't stand up to, to scrutiny. So if it, if it happens, it's it's um, very rare. It does, does occur with Johnson & Johnson. I'm not sure if you wanted to comment on that. Or no, That's I mean, it's, correct. It's, it, does, it does occur with Johnson & Johnson. You're absolutely right. So the US FDA... Um, and the CDC brought up their criteria because in the US, as you know, they don't have the AstraZeneca vaccine, but they have the Johnson Johnson, which is sort of the adenoviral vector vaccine. And it certainly occurs with that. Um, and so that that is something to be aware of if somebody was vaccinated in the US and, and or had some access to Johnson and Johnson vaccine somehow and then came over. Um, and had symptoms, that, that is something definitely to be aware of. Um, the risk with Johnson & Johnson is slightly lower. I think it's about two per million, 1.5 to two per million compared to with AZ vaccine, which is about four to six per million, we think, um, cases of TTS. Um, so yes, it definitely does occur with other adenoviral vector vaccines as well. And so yeah, I guess uh, I was offering that just, just just by way of saying that you know this is something that that is is looked for, of course, with other vaccines being used on really you know at large scale internationally, and the the signals Absolutely. just haven't been there for the mRNA vaccines. Yeah. Sorry to jump in. There was oh sorry no you're right I, I just noticed and I've been keeping a, a bit of an eye on the uh, the UK um, MHRA yellow card reports. And yes. I noticed for the first time in the last last week's last Thursday's report um, that they said there were quote twelve cases of major thromboembolic events with a concurrent thrombocytopenia in the UK following the use of COVID nineteen Pfizer BioNTech uh, vaccine. These events occurred in five women and seven men aged from thirty one to ninety one years. And the overall case fatality rate was 8% with one death reported. So I thought that was got my attention. Um, as you say, there was that singular case report um, that you mentioned, Anoop, um, that was published uh, yeah. about a week ago. Um, but this seemed more than one. Uh, it certainly this it, wasn't it's interesting. Report, yeah, so it, it would be good when more... Uh, data around that comes around, whether it fits the same spectrum of um, VIT or whether it's somewhat different. Um, it's hard to know. I mean, sometimes uh, in severe thrombosis, you can get mild thrombocytopenia. So whether it was um, some sort of association like that, I'm not sure. So until there's more data around what these individual cases actually um, had in terms of detailed review with with the full clinical picture of the degree of thrombocytopenia and uh, the laboratory testing. Um, I'll, I'll be very interested, like you, Lee, to know what, what all that showed. Yes, yes. And look, it's interesting because I thought in the UK, they've given how many doses of Pfizer vaccine, something like I think it's 30 million-ish, um, whereas I think in the United States, in terms of total doses of mRNA vaccine uh, administered, it's something like 300 million, I think. Um, Absolutely. So it's dramatically more. Absolutely. It's dramatically more. And you would have thought, if we were looking at those sorts of numbers, um, correlate, you know, transplanted over to a US context, you'd be seeing a lot more. Yep. Absolutely. And they have a surveillance uh, system that's good enough to pick up the signal in relation to Johnson & Johnson. So, I mean, they do have good surveillance um, there. So I, I think that's an important element in interpreting that. 
Uh, and and, and Sorry, the other ahead. thing to be aware of is we we didn't see these signals in the in the clinical trials, which is another thing we don't understand really well. Um, why we didn't observe the signals, even though you know um, millions of people were vaccinated during the trials as well. Sorry, I am aware that we are well over time now, so maybe just one last question. Um, and this is an interesting one because I've not heard of it. Should we draw back before injecting AstraZeneca vaccine intramuscular? As data from animal studies support the theory that inadvertent IV administration of AstraZeneca vaccine is linked to VITT-like response. Um, interesting. <laughs> I, I couldn't tell you the answer to the question because I don't know, but the hypothesis is interesting. There's been... Um, and, and these are not not necessarily recent studies, but we've known for almost two or three decades that severe adenoviral vector infection can cause um, platelet activation and an endothelial damage. So I think it may not be unreasonable to make sure you're in the muscle and not in a <laughs> blood vessel, for sure. Um, but how much does that translate into activating the endothelial system? The volume is very small. And as I understand, it's just a, a spike protein. It's with the adenoviral vector, which should be fairly innocuous. So I don't know the answer to that question, but it's a good idea to make sure you're, you're not in a blood vessel. Thanks, Luke. And in fact, look, one final question, just going to Tony. Um, if you have a first AstraZeneca and then you're shifting to Pfizer with a second uh, vaccine, for any of the reasons we've talked about during this session, how how long should the gap be, or what's the what's the dose interval? Yeah, so there's not kind of formal strict advice on on a set gap, and obviously this is a very small group of people for whom this applies at the moment. But I think the guidance there is between four and twelve weeks. Thanks for that, Tony. Well, thank you very much for participating uh, in this. Sorry to everyone that we've uh, run a bit over time here, um, Catherine. But oh, it was bucket loads of fun. I really enjoyed that. Over to Catherine. Thanks, Lee, and thanks, Anoop, and thanks, Tony. And I could have uh, carried on for quite a while too, but I'm mindful that uh, our host probably needs to wrap up, and some of you probably have other things to do. But wow, I um, that's that was it was both educational and entertaining to watch uh, the conversation, particularly at the end there. And I really, really want to thank you for the um, the time you've put into prepar preparing for that, Anoop. And I, I know that the uh, few hundred people that are online, um, I'm sure, have learned from that. And hopefully the poll results uh, helped people as well. So I think that kept us all very engaged. So I want to thank everyone who's taken the time to to dial in tonight and to listen and to learn from our, our local experts. Um, and while I'm at it, just to thank everyone for the work that you've been doing for the last 18 months. I don't think any of us thought we'd be still going through this um, 18 months later and having these very regular events um, with you all. But you know, we're, we're all we're all tired, but we're all still going. And so I really want to um, just thank everybody for everything that they're doing to keep the community safe here and congratulate you all on your, on your efforts so far. Uh, I would be remiss of me not to ask you to fill in the education, uh, the evaluation poll, which I think Charles will open if he hasn't already. Um, we really, these are really important to us. This is how we plan uh, the next events, how we make sure that each of the events that we're running is of uh, a quality standard and I think we've done a really good job with that so far or the education team has so yeah if there's anything else you think you'd like to know um, that you or that we should be uh, putting on for you then please just let us know so with all of that I will very much thank our presenters um, I know you've got lots of information and you've had a very genuine offer to uh, seek further advice uh, from the haematologists um, from the vaccine clinic 
and from um, and hopefully all the information that you need as Lee's helpfully provided is on Health Pathways. Both the Hunter New England and the Central Coast site have um, the information that you need if you're online. So without further ado, I'm going to thank everybody and say good night and we'll see you next time. Thanks.